Matthew chapter 5, we'll start there, we'll be in Matthew chapter 6 a lot, and then we'll look some in uh, a few other passages, but uh, this is kind of our main um, passage. The title though today is, What is Important? What is important? And, you know, there's so many different answers we could have for this, you know, what is the most important thing? What is the most important thing to you? And it's easy to think, well, you know, family is most important, or a lot of people think their job is most important, or, you know, who wins the election, or there's so many different ways you could go uh, with what is important. There's many things that are important, but what is, you know, the most important, uh, and what is the most important to you? Not necessarily what do you say is the most important, but what actually is is the most important. What does your schedule reveal about you and what is important? The things that you do each day, what does that reveal about what you think is important? Or your, you know, your, your checkbook, your bank account. By looking at that, can you tell what is important to you? What is important to you? So in uh, you know, Matthew chapter Five here. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so Matthew 5, 6, and 7 uh, is the, the Sermon on the Mount. So you have, you know, the Beatitudes. You know, Jesus uh, goes over a bunch of things. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, you know, blessed are all of these things. And then as it gets into uh, chapter 6, it's more about, um, you know, even you know, walking by faith, you could say. Uh, and then in... Uh, chapter 7, uh, it starts, starts out talking about, you know, judge not, lest you be, be, not, be not judged. And it talks about prayer uh, some as well. But we're, so we're just going to look at a portion of this uh, sermon today. But the first thing I want to look at is in Matthew chapter 5, and one of the blesseds in verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Let's pray. Dear Father, I ask you to help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness here today, that we could, can put everything else aside, put all other distractions, all other thoughts aside, and put you first and foremost, focus on what you are trying to show us here in your word today, and that we will then apply it to our lives for your honor and glory. Lord, I ask you to give me the words to say, uh, in the way in which to say it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So what is important? Well, here in Matthew 5 and verse 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So this must be something that is important, and we're going to see how important in a little bit. But it's a promise of God, that if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled. You'll be satisfied. Satisfaction is something that everyone goes after in one way or another. Wants to be satisfied. But most people are not satisfied. Many people think that if the election goes their way, they'll be satisfied. If that is where you get your satisfaction you will never be satisfied. Uh, you'll never be fulfilled in that way if that's where you get your satisfaction. Well, here is something we can be filled with. We can have the, a satisfaction if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Have you ever had a great hunger or thirst? You know, I think you know, thirst is more, is more telling than hunger. You know, hungry, we can be, you know, we can go a long time without food, much longer than we think we can. Uh, and, uh, but water is, you know, is vital, you know, for a, you can't go very long without water. And the more dry of an area, the more, uh, strain you're under the heat of the area, the more water that you need. Uh, we were, we had the, the privilege of being out in Utah, you know, a couple months ago and, uh, we're able to get a, a, a permit to go in the Coyote Butte North, which is uh, an area leads to the wave. 
and it's really hard to get a permit to go there, and very few people get one, and we got it the first try, first day, you know, it was just God blessed uh, in that way. So we were able to, to go there, and the beauty is incredible. In just a minute, I'll show you some pictures. Uh, but, you know, they stress very strongly how much water to take, and you leave early when it's still cool because it's going to be hot, and you're, there's no way to get back but to walk. You know, there's, uh, and there's not a, a very clear path or trail. They don't have markings out there where to go. Uh, you have to follow a map and, and things so that, because uh, they don't want to disturb, you know, that area. They want to just leave it, uh, you know, all natural uh, in that. Well, so you head out, and this is, you know, on the, kind of heading, heading on the way out there, you know, lots of sand, you know, every, every hill you come to, you have to go over it, you know, there's not really ways around, you know, a lot of places, and it's, you know, a nice strenuous walk. I would much rather go up and over, though, than go through the deep sand. Uh, that was, you know, it's much harder, I think. But then, that's when we got there. Um, that's, I have, you know, lots of pictures, but that's kind of up above the wave looking down into it. The beauty is just beyond description. You know, pictures don't do it justice there. You know, what God uh, has, has created there. Um, I did send a lot of video and pictures to David Reeves, and so hopefully he's going to do a short video of, you know, how this happened. This would have happened during the flood. Um, you know, how does that layer by layer get laid down over millions of years? It can't. There's no scientific way, so you know, I'll hopefully do a, a video on that. But it's just marvelous. And that's, I don't want to get off point there, see a few uh, pictures of that. But then, you know, I, I went a couple of hours farther than Jen and the girls. We started all going, but it's like, oh, this is hard, and it's going to be long, and it's going to be hot. And so I went on, and... Uh, as I started realizing, I wish I had more water. And coming back, you know, it's still beautiful. You look at the pictures and it's so beautiful. But when you start realizing that, like, okay, I got to have this water last me, and start, you start getting a little worried on those things, you don't notice the beauty as much. Your top priority is I need to get to where I can have water. You know, and any time there's shade, you want to be in that shade to try to, you know, cool off for a few minutes. But you see any shade out there? <laughs> you know, there's, I mean, I had, you're literally, you know, I'd, I'd sat under, you know, this little bush just trying to get shade for a couple minutes as I rest. Because uh, I, I had to rest at times, but, you know, out in the sun doesn't really help. But I was thirsty. I mean, and so it's still beautiful, but when you're, your top priority is water, when you don't have that or, uh, or as much as you would like, uh, then you don't notice the beauty around you. Well, when we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, we don't have that righteousness, when we're not filled with that, we're not going to notice the beauty around us like we should. We're going to instead be focused on problems. When we aren't satisfied with what God can give us, we are going to be easily distracted and we're not going to enjoy the life that God has given us. Every situation, every difficulty, you know, on the way out when, you know, we have, have plenty of water and it's cooler and all of those things, it was, uh, you know, going over those tall hills and mountains, you know, weren't a big deal. Uh, and you could enjoy, you know, still taking tons of pictures. You know, look through my pictures. It's amazing how many pictures I took on the way out and how few pictures I took on the way back. Because uh, you're not just enjoying it, sitting and enjoying it, you're just tired, you know, in that. Well, if we don't hunger and thirst after the right thing, then we're not going to be able to enjoy life. We will not enjoy it as much. Because here's the promise that God has for us. When you hunger and thirst after the right thing, after righteousness, He will give you that. You will be filled. You will be satisfied. So now let's turn the, the page Turn over to chapter 6, or a couple pages, and uh, in the end of chapter 6 and verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now this verse is a continuation. It starts with the word but, but seek ye first. So instead of the things it was talking about previously, Seek this first. 
And we're going to talk about some of those things later. Uh, we're going to get back to, we're going to do it backwards and look at those things in a little bit. But we're going to talk about this, the importance of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, instead of, you know, focusing on other things, if we are seeking something else, then we're not seeking him. We're not, if we're seeking something else, we're not seeking Him. You know, our theme verse of the year, Psalm 119, verse 37, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken me, thou me in thy way. So don't focus on the worthless things, the things that you can't change, the things that don't matter, the things that are just temporal. Instead, focus on the things that are eternal. So... Previously in this chapter 6 was talking about the you know, more earthly things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. This ought to be the priority. This ought to be the thing that we are searching for, that we are seeking for. You know, there are some things that God promises to give us in generous portions when we ask. Righteousness is one of those things. Because he said, if that's what you're seeking after, you shall be filled. You're going to have enough. You're going to be satisfied in this. Now, in this, we are not talking about righteousness for salvation, which the, the last message, uh, last Sunday, we talked about that a lot and showed that we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. We have no goodness. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, in Isaiah, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our good works will never get us to heaven. We need the righteousness of Christ. Well, he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus took our sin upon himself, died, was buried, and the third day rose again. And he, if we trust in him, he gives us his righteousness, takes our sin gives us His righteousness. But now as a believer, we need to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness every day. Just because we have His righteousness doesn't mean that we apply it every day. doesn't mean that we're always doing what is righteous. doesn't always mean that we, we are uh, hungering and thirsting after the best things. That w you know, whatever we do, we're out to do the, for the glory of God. And we don't always do that. But we ought to be doing that you know when you you know to seek first the kingdom of god you need to think of have you ever been desperate to find something let's say you're uh, about to take a trip so you're about to head to the airport and get on an airplane and there are some things that are essential for that you need a plane ticket that's pretty important you know that's top priority and things you need to take with you you need your id uh, that's you know vital to be able to get onto the airplane, but some other things you would like to have is maybe a book to read, you know, or maybe a tablet or iPad or something that you can you know uh, watch something on or read on there or whatever. But if you're just about to leave for the airport and you realize that you can't find your keys, is that book to read on the airport at that moment important? If you can't find the book, no, that doesn't matter. You have to be at the airport at a certain time and you can't find your keys. You're going to be, everything else, nothing else matters at that moment. I have to find my keys. I'm going to be late. I'm going to miss the airplane. You suddenly don't care about the book. You don't even care about your, you know, your water bottle that you want to take with you or whatever. You're suddenly, everything is about the keys. That's, the same kind of seeking after God's righteousness. After, you know, now seeking first the kingdom of God, you know, the things that are eternal. Now, God is going to set up his kingdom here on this earth, but that's not for now. We're not trying to usher in his kingdom right now. You know, he's not going to set up his kingdom through the, the president of the United States or anything like that or, you know, or... Uh, or through us, really. Now, we get to be a part of it, but that's after the, we all get raptured, uh, and then after the tribulation, which is seven years, and then we get to come back with, with Christ and rule and reign for a thousand years, and he'll set up a perfect kingdom. But 
here uh, with the seek ye first the kingdom of God, but seek the things that are eternal. Uh, it talks about that earlier in this, this passage, the things that matter for eternity. And seek those things and his righteousness. Seek it as if nothing else matters. That is the most important thing. Once I have that, then other things will fall into place. But I need that. No, I can't go anywhere without my keys. I can't go anywhere without His righteousness. Let's go ahead and, and look at something else. Uh, we'll be back here um, in a bit, but go ahead and turn over to Second Chronicles. And I want to just want to briefly look at something else that God promises to give us. Uh, and this is an instance in which He gave it. But in the New Testament, he promises it uh, to us as well. But in, oh, I was in Samuel, Second Chronicles, and uh, I'll be in chapter 1. Second Chronicles chapter 1 and starting in verse 7. In that night did God, uh, in that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what? I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, I want you to think for a second. What if God asked you this, appeared to you one night and said, what shall I give thee? What do you want? Maybe you would already have a list of things that you would spout off. Or maybe not. Maybe you'd have some time to think about it. But Solomon, this is what he said in verse 8, And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over the people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king." Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there be any after thee uh, have, have the like. He asked for wisdom, and God says, you are going to have that. May we desire wisdom to the same extent. Why did he want wisdom? So that he could rule over the people. He took the responsibility, it has a huge responsibility to be able to rule wisely. Do we take our responsibilities seriously? I'm not talking about work harder to fulfill those responsibilities. Hard work is very important. But do we realize that we can't truly fulfill the responsibilities we have without God's help, without His wisdom, without His righteousness? Do we plead with God, you know, I can't be the pastor I need to be for the people you have given without your wisdom, without your knowledge. I can't be the, the husband, the father I need to be. To each of you, you have a re- responsibilities. Do you seek God's wisdom to fulfill those God-given responsibilities? This was vital for Solomon. He wanted this above all else. Nothing else mattered. God even you know, specifically said, God didn't, didn't ask for riches, wealth, and honor. You know, those are the things in, in Matthew chapter 6 that we're, it shows we're not to, to seek after. We're to give God honor, let Him take care of riches and, and wealth. We're not to seek after those things. 
we're to seek after his righteousness, but we're also to seek after, after wisdom as well, plays a, a part in there uh, as well. You know, last night I mentioned we lost power. When the power goes off, uh, and it doesn't matter what else you're doing in that, in that moment. It might have been important at that moment, but most likely what you were doing is no longer important. Uh, I, was, I was reading at the time, studying for this, but suddenly I didn't just keep doing that, and we got to figure out you know, the big boom that happened outside. You know, what was that? What caused the power to go out? And so as Jen was contacting FPL, I was going outside to figure out, you know, is anything on fire? Or, you know, what's happening out here? Um, but, and then you get the generator going before they get here and all of those things and, and stuff. But it changes your focus. It suddenly changes your focus. We need to realize that without God's power, if we lose power, that has to be our focus. Nothing else matters right now. If I'm not doing what I'm, what I'm doing, if I'm doing what I'm doing without God's wisdom, without His righteousness, without His power, I better stop and get refocused. Nothing else matters at the moment. I need to be, you know, you think about the, uh, the early church. I mean, their priority is we need power from God. And they got it, and they, what did they do right after they got, were filled with, with power from the Spirit? They spoke boldly the Word of God. Uh, they applied it, you know, immediately. Uh, so everything else, you know, becomes secondary uh, until we, you know, fix the problem. So if we lose, lose power with God, that is, needs to be a priority. If we're not getting God's wisdom, that must be a priority. If we're not walking in His righteousness, if we, don't, if we aren't seeking for His will in our life, that's got to be our priority. Everything else becomes secondary. So Solomon was desperate for wisdom to rule the nations. And what happens? God gave it to him. You think, well, I, if only God would do that to me. Well, in James chapter 1, uh, which we can, we, can, we can go over there to James 1. Again, we will be back in Matthew 6. But in James 1 uh, and down in, uh, let's see, in verse 5, it says, And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and what does he do? He says, you know, no, I'm not giving it to you. You don't deserve it. Do any of it? No, he doesn't do that, right? Do any of us deserve his wisdom? No, we don't deserve it. He, no, he says, that giveth to all men liberally in generous portions. And not only that, and upbraideth not. He doesn't say, you don't deserve it. You're such a fool. No, he already knows that. <laughs> He's glad that we're acknowledging that and we need his wisdom. That's a wise thing to do, to ask for his wisdom. And he gives it in the generous portion. It says, and it shall be given him. I mean, that's very definite, right? It might be, no, it doesn't say that. It shall be given him. But, it goes on to say, verse 6, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Uh, for let not that man think that he receives anything of the Lord. You won't receive anything. You won't, will, will not receive this wisdom if you are not asking in faith. It is a promise of God. You know, there's some things we pray about, we don't know if it's God's will. God, your will be done in this. I mean, but there are some things that we know it's God's will. It is God's will for us to have his righteousness and his wisdom. If you seek after righteousness, you will be filled. If you ask for wisdom, believing that he will fulfill that promise, you will have it. You will get that wisdom just as sure as Solomon got it. You know, Jesus in, uh, in John chapter 6 had told the, the, the multitudes after he had, had fed thousands, uh, he had, um, so this is if you're, you don't have to turn there if you don't want, but if in Matthew, or it's John 6, 26 and 27, uh, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye, ye seek me not because uh, ye saw the miracles, be, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him that God the Father uh, sealed. We need to seek eternal things. 
Seek the important things. And there's some people that are just, you know, there's a lot of people, and this is especially uh, in bigger churches, I would, I would say. It tends to be more in bigger churches. Smaller churches have their own problems, but, you know, they tend to be. But there's a lot of people that just kind of tag along. They're kind of on the outskirts of the church. Yeah, they show up, you know, but they don't want to ever do anything or be a part of anything. But they just, they want to be a part of the blessings. And that's what some of the people are following around Jesus. They didn't want to sacrifice. They didn't want to actually be righteous. But hey, if he, if he does the miracle of feeding people, oh, I want to take a part in that. You know, they want the benefits without any sacrifice, without really being righteous, without seeking eternal benefit, uh, not only for themselves, but for other people. I'm not talking about seeking eternal life or seeking heaven. That's a free gift. But God promises to reward those that labor for him, that work for him, that suffer for righteousness' sake. Uh, he will reward us. Uh, and those are eternal rewards that fadeth not away. But what is important to you? Eternal things or temporary things? You know, as a country, we've lost our way. You know, we've lost our way. Uh, and, you know, the Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation and sin is a reproach. And I think we're going to be reproached as a nation um, because our, our nation has turned against God. You know, there's hatred for truth. There's hatred for righteousness. Um, there's hatred for the things of God. But the, the change does not start with the world. If we want to affect that, it doesn't start with the world starts right here. It starts with me. Each of us has to, in our own mind, say that. The change starts with me. Are we seeking first God's will, God's way, His righteousness? Is that first? Is that priority in our life? Well, continuing in James chapter 1, uh, down in uh, let's look at verse 19. Let's look at a bunch here. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Man, may we take that you know, into, into consideration. Calm down. Be swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. For, in verse 20, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Hey man, if I, you know, I have this righteous anger, you know, there, I can force things into my will. No, we can't force things into, in, into our will. Um, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. But, but be ye doers of the word, it's easy to focus on other people who are ignoring God's word, who hate God's word. What about us? But us, what are we doing? But be ye doers of the word, in verse 22, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straight way forgetteth what manner of man he is, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful uh, hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We need to do the things that God says in his word. Don't ignore it. Don't just point out other people's faults, but no. Look in the glass ourselves. Look in the mirror of God's Word and see what is wrong with me. What is wrong with me? You know, if you want to see a problem with somebody else, you don't look in a mirror. You know, you just look at it. But we need to be looking in a mirror. What is wrong with me? Not pointing out other people's problems always, but first, now there is a place for that. Uh, and we have to restore such one in the spirit of meekness. Um, that is a command we are to do. But only if... We have looked in the mirror of God's word and gotten right with him. You know, yes, there is a, a time to remove the, the speck out of somebody else's eye, but not when we have a beam coming out of our own eye. 
You know, we can't, must not be hypocritical about this. And we can always be better. We must always be getting better and better at this. You can know the Word of God and not be living righteously. There was a, when I was in high school, there was a, a guy that came in, in high school, and I don't even know if he stayed a year. Maybe he was there a little over a, one school year, but I remember he left in the middle of the school year. And... Um, he had been in a lot of trouble beforehand and stuff, and he'd been put in, you know, halfway houses and different things. And then some of them were Christian, where he had to memorize Scripture. And he had a mind that he could just retain things. And, wow, could he quote the Scripture. I mean, man, he could do it. But apply it? No. <laughs> you know, that wasn't, wasn't there. I pray that it is now, um, but uh, just because you know the Word of God does not mean you are living righteously. You know, it is really easy. You know, I'm speaking from myself for experience, and I'm sure you have the same thing. It's easy to read the Word of God and you think of somebody else when you get to a verse. That's easy to do. And it might be harder for me than it, that thing, harder for me than it is for you. One of the reasons is because I have to get up here and preach multiple times a week. And so it might, you know, as I'm reading through, oh, this would be good for the church, or this would be, no, I don't want to just be making decisions that way. I need to be, in my devotions, it has to be, what does God have for me? Uh, and then God reveals what he wants, you know, what the church needs. Uh, let him do that. But um, we all need to make sure that we are reading the Word of God properly in that way, applying it to ourselves first. And yes, God will reveal who we need to, you know, also help guide in that way. Like I talked about responsibility a little while ago, God will give you that wisdom in order to fulfill those responsibilities uh, as, as well. Uh, but here it said, Wherefore lay apart, in verse 21, all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, uh, and so on. Well, you know, it's easier to find something when you clear away the clutter. You know, we're to run this, with, this race with patience, but we're to, to remove the weights and the sins that easily beset us. Remove the things that distract us. Uh, that, you, you know, if, if, um, if you're, let's say, in the shower, and, you have, and uh, somebody is on the outside of the bathroom door and they're trying to ask you a question through the bathroom door, they can be yelling, Everybody in the house can hear them asking you the question, but you can't understand what they're saying. You can't hear them. Why is that? Because you have the noise of the water in your ear. Uh, or if you get a phone call and you're in a, in a room with a bunch of people and it's loud, somebody could be talking in your ear. You have the phone right to your ear, but you can't hear them. Is that because they're not speaking loud enough? No, most likely it's because everybody else around you is loud. So what do you do? Hang on just a second. And you go to a quiet place so you can then hear them. How often are we the same way? We can't find the right priority in life. We can't find the kingdom of God and His righteousness and it's not because God's not speaking. It's not because God hasn't given us instructions here in his word. It's that we have too much other noise around us going on. We say, okay, hang on just a second. Let me get to a quieter place. Let me remove these other distractions so that I can wholly focus on what you are wanting me to do. Remove those distractions. Okay, so now let's go back to Matthew chapter Six. In the beginning of chapter 6, going back to, to verse 1, he starts talking about our, our giving. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. The first three things here, so really from verses 1 through 18, he talks about giving, he talks about praying, and he talks about fasting. Now, 
many Christians don't do any of those three things. <laughs> or, uh, or you could say all Christians fall short in some of those things at times. Giving, praying, and fasting. These are all things that I think we all ought to do. You know, even the, the fasting isn't talked about very often. It doesn't say, moreover, if ye fast. It says, moreover, when ye fast. You know, don't be as that. None of these are to be done for our honor. You know, we look at some of these things as, oh, that's just for the righteous, the holy people, the giving and the praying and fasting. No, this is for all Christians but it's not to receive our honor. People, if possible, shouldn't even know about what we're doing. Now, people are going to know to a certain extent. You know, when, when Jesus said, you know, don't be like you know, the person who's giving in a, in a huge way, but then he talks about the, you know, remember he talked about the widow's might? Well, she wasn't be doing it to be seen by anybody, but Jesus did see her. Uh, and then you had the, the person, the, the Pharisee, who's praying all big prayers and hoping people notice, notice how righteous and holy he is. And then there's the other man, you know, crying out that he's a sinner. Um, he wasn't there to be seen by men, but he was seen by men. You know, they did see him. So what is your motive in that? Um, you know, can you absolutely avoid people not knowing that you give or when you give or any of that? No, and that's not the point of it. The point is, what is your motive? What is your motive? Is your motive right with God? With, with fasting, what is your motive? Is it to really seek God's face, to show God that there's, in this time, at this moment, there is nothing more important to me than you. It's not food. It's not entertainment. It's not anything else. Nothing is important to me right now than you. And so I'm just seeking your face, putting everything else aside. Uh, it's not to bring honor to myself or any of that. So that's the focus, really the first 18 verses there, but he focuses on giving, praying, and fasting. All very important things that we need to do, uh, and some in more than others, but, uh, we, but we all need to be looking at those things. Saying, are, we not, are we doing it for the right motives, but also are we doing it? And are we doing it um, as often as we ought to? But then we need, to, we need to seek heavenly treasures, not earthly. Heavenly treasures, not earthly. And um, so that's where in verse 19 it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Why are you doing what you are doing? You know, there are, you know, it, it goes on to talk about, you know, our earthly care and, um, you know, take no thought for your life and what you shall eat or drink or what raiment you should, should put on because, you know, we can't control that. So does that mean we shouldn't go to work? We shouldn't earn a paycheck? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But whatever you do, do to the glory of God. So when you're going to work, you know, you're not going to work to survive, to get that paycheck, to be able to, uh, now that the end result are those are some of those things, but it should be for the glory of God, earning a paycheck for the glory of God, um, eating to the glory of God, every purchase we make for the glory of God. And, you know, the uh, it's easy to think that so many things that we think about in the Christian life. Well, that was under the law. That's not under grace. Whether it's it's giving, or even some people put fasting and some of those things. But we need to be very clear here. In this sermon that Jesus is giving, back in chapter 5, 
he mentioned some of the things of the law. You know, it says, thou shall not kill. He said, but no, I'm going farther than that. If you hate somebody, you've committed murder in your heart. The law says, thou shall not commit adultery. But I'm saying, I'm going further than that. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Uh, and so on and so forth, every step of the way. Uh, he says, you know, it says, love your, your neighbor. He said, no, but I'm going farther than that. You need to love your enemy. Under grace, there's a lot more, it's a lot more higher, it's a hot, lot higher standards than under the law in some way. Oh yeah, we don't have to sacrifice animals. Nobody you know, brought a lamb today to sacrifice and we don't have to follow any of those things. But there's so many that think, oh, I have just freedom to do whatever I want. I don't have to follow after righteousness. No, under grace, we have a higher standard we're supposed to follow, not a lower standard. And I think the, the same principle applies even to giving. And so people say, well, the tithe, that's, that's just Old Testament. You know, that's just, that was part of the law. The tithe wasn't part of the law. You know, that was, Abraham was before the law, and he was giving back then. So that was before the law. That's always been around. And under the law with their sacrifices and some, someone put, actually put the number like 23% or, or so with other things that they give above their, their tithes. Um, but a tithe, what is a tithe? Well, it's just, I mean, there's a, it's a definition of 10%. You know, so I think that is important um, to do. And, you know, in saying that, you know, I don't talk about, about giving much at all, and I probably should more, not for the sake of the church, not for us, but for the sake of you. You know, the Apostle Paul said, you know, he was told the church at Philippi, hey, I'm glad that you found opportunity to give again. He said, not for my own self, but for you, that you could be blessed. You know, we get blessed when we give. You know, so that is a, a very important thing. But let's not get, start thinking, well, under grace, we don't have, you know, we have freedom from, uh, you know, all restrictions. No, what are we to seek first? kingdom of God and his righteousness. So let that righteousness apply. So yes, there's a lot of the laws in the Old Testament that don't apply, but there are other things that, are, that apply to a greater extent. So, or you might think, well, under, under the law, they had to give certain things. You know, they had to give certain sacrifices, give certain amounts, there's much more stringent things. But under grace... This is the way I look at it. I, I think we are, are supposed to look at it. You know, we're told whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Every, I think we look at everything. 100% of what we have is God's. We don't own anything. We're a servant of God. So 100% of what we have belongs to Him. So I need to use that wisely. Whether it's you know, I'm giving directly to the, the work of God or whether I'm going to the store and buying stuff. It all belongs to him. We need to do all to the glory of God. So when that also applies when we go to work. We're doing that. We ought to do that for the glory of God. We're not doing that because, well, I have to, you know, pay the mortgage. I have to, uh, you know, feed my family, all of those things. Now, those things are you know, obviously come into play. God uses um, the work you do to take care of those things. But our number one priority is to serve God. Now, we do that by going to work, by doing the things that God has called us to do. We are commanded to provide for our families uh, and things, but we're put Him number one. If your reason for going to work is to get ahead in life, You'll never get any satisfaction from that. Oh, maybe in your checkbook you're ahead in life. But remember what matters. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Why? Because moth and rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal. It can be gone in a flash. It doesn't take much for it to be gone. Instead, lay, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor rust, where neither one of those uh, are. They don't corrupt you know, thieves can't break through and steal. Does that mean you should live in a tent and, you know, not have a mortgage and any of that? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But whatever you have, 
that's God's. That's for his glory and his honor. If God blesses you with you know, a big, beautiful place and all that, praise God. Use it for his honor and glory. You know, for us, you know, personally, I would much rather have a smaller place that didn't have the responsibilities of a grove and, you know, and, and all of these things. But the, the purpose of getting this property was hopefully, and hopefully continues to be, was for the glory of God. So we can have services here and uh, have church here. But we, may we all look at what we have as for the glory of God. That God, use me. Use my talents. Use my money. Use the things that you have given me for your honor and glory. Because at times God's going to ask you to do something that takes a step of faith. Whether it's work less hours so you could do something for him that he wants you to do. Yeah, but if I work less, less hours, I don't know if I'm going to have the money to survive. If God, that's what God wants you to do, what does he say in this passage? He's going to provide. He will provide if that's the way he's, he's leading. Or it could be... Uh, I mean, you can only fill in the blank. God, the more time you spend in God's word, he will show you more things. He will lay burdens on your heart. Maybe it will be, you know what? Uh, Pastor Missall needs to be able to buy that property. And God's laid it on my heart. And so, you know, but, oh man, if I do this, I don't know if we would be able to put a down payment on the house we wanted to get or, you know, whatever, or get the car we wanted to get or seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He will take care of those things. I'm going to save, I think, Matthew 6.34. Uh, I had some other verses I wanted to look at. Instead, I'm, going to end, um, I'm just going to end with this. Joshua and Caleb, remember when they went, into the, went to spy out the land with the ten other spies? They came back with two different reports. They'd all seen the same things, but they focused on different things. The, ten, the other ten spies, what did they focus on? The enemy. We can't defeat them. They have walled cities. All of their warriors are giants. You know, we can't defeat them. They will just wipe us out. Joshua and Caleb, they focused on, on two things. One uh, was... The, the potential of the land, you know, all the fruit of the land. But really, I think what they focus on is they focus on the promises of God. That, yes, there are big enemies and all of that, but God promised he's going to deliver them into our hand. And therefore, he's going to deliver all of those wonderful things we see in the, the land flowing with milk and honey. He's going to deliver those to us. They focused on different things, and because of that, they came to different conclusions. We as a church must be unified. The only way to be unified is to be focused on the right thing. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. He will take care of the other things. Don't get distracted from the main Thing. Don't take your eyes off the main thing. So, so what do we do next? Joshua and Caleb, what did they want to do next? Was it, hey, let's go pick out that city and defeat it? No, that wasn't the next thing. The next thing was enter the promised land. God told them to do that, so that was the next thing. Just start walking. Enter the promised land. Yeah, but what about, what about that the warriors are going to defeat us. No, don't worry about that. Do the next thing. When that problem comes, God is going to take care of that. God is going to provide, like he did 40 years later, provide a way to defeat Jericho, to defeat Ai, to defeat on and on and on they, they went. Are there many things we could worry about? This week has revealed more things to worry about than, you know, and than most weeks. Uh, we have a divided country. Uh, and, we'll, and just be praying that, you know, that God's will will be done and that if there what seems to be widespread corruption and all of that, that God would reveal it, that God would show it, that God would make it evident, that it would become obvious. You know, pray for those things. And 
But what do we do? Do we worry about all that? No, let's seek first the kingdom of God. Am I walking right? Am I seeking His righteousness? Am I reading His word and then doing it? Am I hearing it, but then also am I doing it? I pray that, that we are. So what is important? What's important to me? What really matters to me? Well, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, that has to be the first and foremost most thing. And if you're watching on, on YouTube, you know this is the most important thing. Nothing else matters if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior. The reason this is so important is because we're all sinners. And if this hand represents all of us and this remote here represents our sin, we have all sinned, come short of the glory of God. And if we die with that sin on us, we will die and spend an eternity in hell forever. If this isn't paid for, we will spend eternity in hell paying for it. See, the wages of sin is death. And so we can't work our way to heaven. You know, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You cannot earn your salvation. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how can we go to heaven? Well, let this hand represent Jesus. He came to this earth. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. You know, he shed his precious blood. He died. He was buried, and the third day rose again. And so how do we get that, that free gift of eternal life? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's, that's you and me, believeth in him, should not perish. He won't go to hell, but shall have everlasting life, should go to heaven. So trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, that you could not pay for your sin, but instead you put your trust and faith in Jesus, that he took your sin, shed his blood, died, was buried, and the third day rose again. If you believe that, you can know for sure that you're going to heaven.